Hello, everybody. Welcome to our broadcast today. I'm Pastor Steve Green. My wife, Penny, and I pastor here at Breton Word of Faith Church. Today is Sunday, August 29th, and our subject is the good eye. Our intended result for today's message is that we would be motivated toward having a good heart. And the eye is an illustration that Jesus uses uh, to help us picture our heart, to understand our heart. So the good eye and a pure heart are the same thing. So again, our objective is that we would be motivated toward having a good eye, that we would be motivated toward having a pure heart. We need to be motivated because there's a challenge to it. It's an uphill battle. It's something that we need to want. But the benefits of uh, getting a good eye, the benefits of having a pure heart are much greater than whatever effort goes into finding that place. Uh, one of the things uh, just to review things quickly that we want to touch on is that it's love that cleanses our heart. Uh, it is the act of loving one another according to the Word of God, being obedient to the Word of God that cleanses our heart. We see on the whiteboard this illustrated that by doing His words, by acting upon the Word of God in faith, by loving other people, living under divine discipline, there's a cleansing action that happens and the result of that cleansing action is we have a pure heart. Now, in the Greek, the word not always, but most often used for cleansing is katharizo. Uh, and the word used for pure is katharos. So they're from the same word family. Uh, this is a verb and this is an adjective. So the, the relationship is very simple. Uh, it's a little less obvious in the English, but in the Greek, it is through the process of katharizo that we then have a katharos heart. Obviously, uh, we can see the connection there. We see in 1 Peter 1 22, since you've purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. So we have the sincere love of the brethren right here. Uh, it has a cleansing action. It has a purifying action. And because of that, we can now uh, love one another from a pure heart. Because our heart has been purified, we now love from a pure heart. Praise the Lord. In 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, this is referring to that right here, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So the point that we're initially looking at here is that it's the love of God from us to other people that causes our own heart to be cleansed. The result of being catharizoed is we have a catharos heart. Now, what uh, does that mean about us? Uh, well, one of the things that we've emphasized already and is obvious is that because of the cleansing, we have a pure heart. We saw that in 1 Peter 1.22. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse 21, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, if anyone cleanses himself from uh, the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified. So sanctification is one of the results of cleansing. Uh, the word sanctified simply means uh, being made holy. Sometimes some verses use the word sanctified, other verses use the word holy. We'll see that. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, uh, and, be, and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Verse 22, flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Praise the Lord. So there's the pure heart again. If anyone cleanses himself, he's going to have a pure heart. So that's one result of cleansing. Another one is sanctification, which we just saw in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Another scripture uh, that talks about cleansing producing sanctification is 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. I'm reading out of the New um, <clears throat> New. American Standard Bible, according to the foreknowledge of God, 1 Peter 1, 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the, God the Father, by the sanctifying work, by the sanctifying work uh, of the Spirit uh, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. So the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, which is a cleansing thing, it happens as we obey Jesus, 
Uh, as we obey Jesus, we're sprinkled with his blood and it produces a sanctifying work in us. And then the third thing that we're reading, and all these things are very closely related, just different words to describe the same thing. And it's helpful to see these different words describe the same thing because it simplifies our Bible. It helps us understand our Bible better because we can come be reading different portions of the Bible, reading different words, and understand that, um, that it's not a new subject, it's not a different tangent that we're on, but it's uh, repeatedly, the Bible's repeatedly speaking of the same things. Uh, we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12, and may the Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. So it's the heart, again, that is being made holy. A pure heart is a holy heart. In 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. So just as cleansing produces a pure heart, and just as it also produces sanctification, it also makes us holy. To be sanctified and to be made holy are identically the same thing. Uh, many times uh, in the New Testament, it's the same Greek words that when translated into English, sometimes are translated sanctified, sometimes made holy. But again, it's the same Greek word behind it. In Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 25 to 27, husbands love your wives. And then in verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So there's a cleansing action by the word of God that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So there's another scripture, Ephesians 5 verses 25 to 26, that make the connection that holy, that sorry, that cleansing produces holiness. So uh, numerous scriptures that, um, that give us a reason to believe that. Now the pure heart uh, that we are speaking of, the sanctified heart, the holy heart, is illustrated by Jesus in different ways. One way is he calls it the good eye. The pure heart and the good eye are the same thing. In, in Matthew 5 and verse 8, he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see. So a person with a pure heart has the ability to see, and in particular to see God in that verse. He says in verse chapter 6 and verse 22, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. So a good eye um, is again, the pure heart, and it produces a very good result in us. We have the ability, the good eye gives us the ability to see and to know spiritually. Uh, other illustrations, well, first of all, on the eye still, Matthew 7 and verse 5, one we're very familiar with. First, remove the plank from your own eye. Um, that would be obstacles from your own heart. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So there's the ability to see that comes from a pure heart. The ability to see, just as it is naturally, it's a huge, huge benefit uh, physically to be able to see. It is equally a huge benefit. Maybe more importantly, uh, it's even a greater benefit to be able to see spiritually. Uh, it comes from having a good eye. Jesus also used the tree to uh, illustrate to illustrate what a good heart is. A good heart is like a good tree, like a good fruit tree. He said in Matthew 12, verses 33 to 34, either make the tree good and its fruit good. You see, the heart just doesn't automatically become pure. We're not just born with a pure heart, um, and neither in the sense that we're talking about right here, are we born again with a pure heart. Um, it is something that we, we practice in our relationship with the Lord. It is something that comes through loving other people, as we say, uh, that produces the pure heart in us. And so Jesus said we need to make the tree good, make the fruit tree good. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Verse 34, brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart, the 
now speaks. So Jesus clearly identifies when he's talking about a good tree, he's talking about our hearts. Another illustration that Jesus uses, uh, one that I would think we're also very familiar with, is soil, good soil. Uh, we know the parable of the soil, of the sower rather, the parable of the sower and the seed. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, uh, Jesus said in the English Standard Version, as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast uh, in an honest and good heart. So the good soil also is referring to our heart. And, and it, he says, an honest and a good heart. Uh, and then bear fruit with patience. And so uh, this pure heart, is going to come according to the parable of the sower and the seed uh, in which Jesus is describing what the good soil is. It's coming from a, an honest and a good heart. And the honesty, uh, we can, it stems right back to the beginning where uh, we are honest with ourselves uh, regarding the words of Jesus, what he's saying to us, and we choose to trust in what he said and the help of the Holy Spirit um, energizes us and, and because of our honesty with the Word of God, our faith in the Word of God, our very realistic approach we're taking. We're not just, um, uh, just what would be a good word? We're not just uh, discarding the Word of God or neglecting it or, or letting it just drift aside, but we're seizing it. We're taking hold of it. We're uh, <clears throat> in, in, in the verse we just read, Jesus said, the good soil is the person who holds it fast. So we seize upon the Word of God and we're honest with how we're doing with it. We're honest in our need for it. We're honest in our failures uh, to live well apart from the Word of God. So we are dependent upon the Word and the, the grace that's in the Word and the help of the Holy Spirit. And so it's the honest heart that is the good soil that produces purity. Praise the Lord. And so this is something that is a big deal. It is what Jesus is referring to over and over again. It's what the whole New Testament is referring to over and over again. Again, this whole whiteboard here is, um, it's, an, it's the underlying structure of the New Testament. And so the, the pinnacle of this a mountain that we're climbing is uh, the pure heart. As you know, we're not referring to, um, or we're not, saying or implying that our hearts in this life become perfect, absolutely perfect, absolutely pure, but that absolute perfection and purity is something that we're aiming for and we can uh, enjoy it and we can live in it and we can have it to a significant degree. Uh, it's something that is meant to transform our lives. Um, to, to uh, cause, as we have written down here, to have Christ to be formed in us, where we become filled with the fruit of the Spirit. And as we're going to be looking at today, we become good at ministry, good at making disciples. Uh, there's different ways that the Scripture puts this. We serve Him acceptably. We become useful to the Master, where we can see clearly, because our eye is made good, we can now see clearly uh, to take the speck out of our brother's eye. Um, we we become the spiritual person in Galatians 1 and 2 that is able to restore our brother. There are other benefits. There are other fruits. Uh, again, the, the heart is illustrated by the tree. The purpose of a good tree is to produce good fruit. The purpose of good soil is also to produce good fruit. And so it is this pure heart illustrated by these things that produce in our lives um, these many different benefits. The, the, the knowledge of Him, knowing Him, knowing Him intimately. The, the second aspect of salvation, the abundant life Jesus spoke, in, spoke about, being blessed. Uh, living in His love was another phrase that Jesus used to describe it. All these benefits come from a pure heart. So the, in, in ultimately, our purpose is to glorify God, and God is glorified in all of these things. That, that is the long term, or, or that's the, the big picture would be a good way of putting it. Uh, that's the ultimate uh, destination, is that God would be glorified. The more intermediate destination for us is that we want our heart purified, because once our heart is purified, then all of these things tend to flow, just tend to flow. That's why we, we show it as a downward thing. It, it works just by the force of gravity. It's um, much easier for a, a, a pure heart to produce these many different types of 
fruit than it is for us to um, get to and maintain a pure heart in the first place. So that's why we need to be motivated to have a pure heart. We need to be motivated to have a good eye. So the good eye obviously sees clearly. The bad eye does not see that clearly. The good eye has the ability to see and to know spiritually. Uh, we looked at some of these scriptures last week. I'll just touch upon them briefly again. Um, we're doing well for time. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 2, Paul said to the Corinthians, uh, who he said the previous, or sorry, in chapter 1 and verse 5, I believe it is, he said that they've been enriched with all knowledge, so they know everything they need to know. They're very knowledgeable in the gospel. Um, they not only know these things, they, they, they know that they know, and so that they really think that they know a lot. Uh, and then in chapter 8, that was chapter 1 and verse 5, then in chapter 8, Paul says to him, 1 Corinthians again, and if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet is he ought to know. So what we've understood in the intervening chapters from chapter 1 to chapter 8 is that the Corinthians are not walking in love. Uh, they are competing with one another. Uh, they are not maturing spiritually. They are yet baby Christians. Uh, there are contentions among them. Uh, they're fighting amongst themselves. And the result of that is because they're not walking in love, even though they, they know a lot, they, they know His words, they're very, they're very much filled with these words in their head, but because they're not activating these words by walking in love, uh, by believing in these words to motivate them to walk in love, because they're not doing that, they actually uh, don't really know anything at all as they need to know. So there's different types of knowing. There's the initial knowing, and then there is the spiritual knowing. Uh, what a, an amazing thing that is to see that. What an amazing discovery that is in our relationship with the Lord. That it's one thing to know uh, from reading in the Bible, from hearing the words spoken, um, but it's another thing altogether to, to put that word into practice and to have the eyes of our hearts opened up by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we literally can see uh, clearly into God's world, into the kingdom world. What a huge benefit, as we've said earlier. Uh, that is, man, that is something to, greatly to be desired. It is, it is tremendously transformative. It's, it's the only thing um, in life that is transformative, is to be able to, to see what God is doing, to, to, to be able to see Him, to be able to see how His kingdom works, to participate fully in His kingdom, to have a pure heart is the best thing that any of us can have in this life. Uh, it comes only through a relationship with Jesus. It comes only through loving the brethren. And so, uh, if anyone thinks he knows anything, Paul said to the Corinthians, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. So the Corinthians were deceived. Uh, they, they thought they knew so much, but really they knew nothing. Uh, and James speaks about the same deception. He says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So there is no way uh, given in the scriptures to come to this place other than by following uh, the words of Jesus. Uh, we read last week in Philippians 1 and verses 9 to 10 that, uh, that Paul prayed for them that they would abound in love and that this uh, love would be with discernment and in uh, knowledge and all discernment. And so there again we see how there's an, an opening of our eyes that comes with walking in love. In Philippians 3, chapter or verses 8 and 10, or 8 to 10, um, he speaks about the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus uh, our Lord. So we're talking about knowledge, the ability to see things spiritually, to know things spiritually. He goes on to describe how that knowledge comes from the righteousness which is from God by faith. And he's speaking of functional righteousness, this action right here. He says, the righteousness in verse 9, which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. In the Amplified in Ephesians 3 verses 17 to 19, we read about how walking in love uh, causes us to really come to know practically through experience for ourselves the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. 
Uh, we read in John 8 and verse 12 that those that follow Jesus shall not walk in darkness but uh, have the light of life. The light that, that it's a spiritual light. Uh, it's a light by which we can see. It's a light that is that produces the abundant life of God in us. A few verses later, in verses 31 to 32, again, this is John 8, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him, uh, If you abide in My Word, you are My disciples indeed. Abide in the Word means doing the words. There's numerous scriptures we could look to about that. If you abide in My Word, you are My disciples indeed, and you will know the truth. So knowing comes from, again, doing the Word of God. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Spiritual freedom um, is, comes from a pure heart. In 1 John 2 and verse 5, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. So there's just script, literal, literally scripture after scripture after scripture that emphasizes the ability to see and know spiritually comes from practicing the word of God. Be, having our hearts exercised um, to uh, <clears throat> exercised in the practice of the word of God. Amen. Now, we're not talking, when we talk about the ability to see and know spiritually, we're not talking about the ministry of the prophet. That is a whole other thing. That's a gift. It's a ministry gift. Uh, but we're, and not everybody is a prophet. Obviously, not, not everybody is going to be a seer. Uh, that's another term for a prophet is a seer. Not everybody's going to be that. In fact, relatively few of the body of Christ are going to be prophets but we can all see and know spiritually in a very basic and necessary way for our lives. Praise the Lord. So one of the purposes for seeing clearly, so a pure heart, then a pure heart sees clearly, uh, and one of the purposes uh, for the ability to see clearly is in order to then be, is in order, uh, it's going to be part of loving people, loving people from a pure heart. And the purpose of that is to, one of the purposes is to make disciples. Is to, As we mentioned earlier, is to serve God acceptably, to be useful to Him, is to be able to take the speck from our brother's eye. And so we're going to close with these thoughts today. Um, <clears throat> the purposes for seeing clearly, uh, number one, is to serve God acceptably to serve God acceptably. There is a level of service that God would like to see from us. It's a, a level of service that He finds acceptable, uh, a level of service that is pleasing to Him. He wishes to be served well. And a person who has a pure heart is going to serve Him much better than if we don't have a pure heart. A, a person that sees clearly what to do and what not to do is going to serve him better than if we cannot see clearly. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, I thank God whom I serve, whom I serve, it's the Greek word latruo, with a pure conscience, and the conscience is our conscience. That's the Greek word sunidesis, speaking about seeing together with. Uh, Paul says that he has a pure conscience. Um, and that from that pure conscience, he serves God. As his forefathers did without ceasing, he says, I remember you in my prayers night and day. And so uh, this having a pure heart, uh, here's a, another good thing. We've said this before, but as bears repeating, is that although we do not perfectly in this life come to having uh, an absolutely uh, pure heart in every respect. Uh, Paul said that he had not been perfected uh, in Philippians 3. We just read earlier out of Philippians 3. Um, he says that um, he hasn't been perfected, um, but Nevertheless, in different places, like for example, where we're reading now in 2 Timothy 1, he says he serves God with a pure conscience. And a pure conscience is very closely related to, I would say that it's the same thing as having a pure heart. Uh, we discussed last week how a, the conscience is a function of the heart. To have a pure conscience is um, a function of having a pure heart. And Paul said that he had a pure conscience. And so, um, for example, in the oil field, there's pipes 
and, and there's two inch pipe, three inch pipe, four inch pipe. Now these pipes are not exactly two inches, they're not exactly three or four inches, but they are nominally, uh, that would be the word they use, They're the nominal measurement is two, three or four inches, uh, other sizes as well. And, and so uh, the point would be that we may not uh, technically have a pure heart uh, in, in an absolute sense, but nominally we can have a pure heart. We can have a heart that's been purified enough that it becomes very helpful and very functional for the Lord. And, and aren't you glad about that? that it, uh, it's something that we can work at. It, it, we uh, increase at it uh, bit by bit, step by step, degree by degree. We can grow to increasingly have a pure heart. Glory to God. In Hebrews 9 and verse 14, uh, the writer says, But how much more shall the blood of Christ, and this is talking about cleansing again, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience, from dead works to serve the living God. So again, what we're looking at right now is a key feature of a pure heart is it gives us the ability to serve. It gives us the ability um, to uh, serve the living God. Uh, in chapter 12 of Hebrews, uh, we read in verse 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And so, uh, and that's that chapter 12 uh, scripture we just read uh, stems from chapter 9, where we read that it's a pure conscience. It is the pure conscience that allows us to serve God and to be... Um, and, and it cleanses us from dead works. Praise the Lord. So uh, that is one way of putting it. This is one of the features of having a pure heart is, the, uh, is the, the ability to see clearly in order to, and number one is to serve God acceptably. Number two, to be useful to the master. Just a different way of saying the same thing. We read that already uh, in... <clears throat> In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So that would be a second way of putting it. We can serve him accept acceptably. We're useful to the master. We can remove the speck from our brother's eye. Remember how Jesus put that in Matthew 7. First remove the plank from your own eye. First cleanse your own heart. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. All of these are referring to our service to God, our service to other people. It's referring to our ministry where we're being made effective in our ministry. We're uh, skillfully making disciples, we're serving God acceptably, we're useful to the master, we're taking the speck from our brother's eye. Uh, in Galatians 6 and verse 1, uh, Paul puts it like this, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Uh, I like the the, the King James that says, in a spirit of meekness. Um, it's the Greek word praates that is, I think, better translated meekness than gentleness. Meekness is the, uh, is the strength of spirit by which we are able to receive. And, and we're exhorted in the scripture to be meek toward one another, to receive one another. Uh, in, in other words, um, this would um, speak of long suffering, forbearance, the ability to receive um, somebody that otherwise we may not receive that well. This is a strength. This is a spiritual strength. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It is meekness. Uh, we read again in Galatians 6 and verse 1, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, well, it's people that are overtaken in trespasses that not uncommonly are, are stressful to us. They're causing us trouble. Uh, their trespass is often against to us in particular. It's a person we might ang easily be angry with, but rather than that, if, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Or, uh, and that, would, that meekness would be the ability to receive, to be kind toward, gentle toward somebody who we might be finding irritating. Um, 
considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, uh, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, the way that we bear somebody else's burden is we bear with them as they are under the burden of having a fault. There, there's some kind of a moral failure that's happening in their life. And so it's going to be a spiritual person that is able to restore such a person. It's going to be a spiritual person that's going to be meek in the face of whatever difficulty um, they are facing in the other person. Uh, so again, we're speaking of um, having a pure heart, being spiritual, um, and then being able, because of that, to relate well, to minister well to other people. Uh, and then finally, we could say all of this is simply uh, <clears throat> described by the umbrella term loving from a pure heart. And we read in how Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5, now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart. The purpose of Jesus speaking to us is that we would love people from a pure heart. The reason that Jesus taught when he was on the earth, all the different things Jesus said when he was on the earth, it was for this purpose that you and I today would have the capacity to love other people, to love them effectively, to be effective ministers. Uh, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. So what a good place that is to end, is that God has called us. He's called us to numerous things. He's called us to many blessings. He's also caused us, he's also caused, he does cause, he's also called us to serve, to serve acceptably, to be skilled in it, to be useful in it, to effectively remove the speck from our brother's eye, to be um, helpful at restoring people that have troubles and that are uh, not rooted and grounded in love themselves. This is a, a very noble, very admirable, very necessary calling. It's a calling that every born-again believer has. Um, all of us need to be able to see clearly uh, in order to help out, um, help God out in what He is doing in this earth. Thank you for joining us today. We trust that you are being motivated to have a good eye. You're being motivated to have a pure heart. You're being motivated to do all the spiritual work that is necessary in order to love people consistently, uh, unrelenting, in unrelenting fashion, day after day, literally minute by minute, new numerous circumstances we face during the day to truly love people, to be reliable uh, and accountable to God in how we love people. Praise the Lord. Uh, this is what makes us useful in this life. Glory to God. Uh, thank you again for joining us. We want to, to I don't know, I can't see you, but <laughs> I was going to say, I want to see you again next week. I'd like to see you in church, in in-person church. I'd like for you to see me if you can't be in church uh, in this video broadcast. Thanks for joining us today.